Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all doing? Scotty D49 here with you once again for another installment of How to Play Warhammer 40k. Now, in this series, we've been talking about how you can play the game and the different varieties that there are of that, how to go about and what is involved in constructing army lists for the game, and finally, we're also going to be starting to get into the core mechanics of the game and how you actually play a game. So in this video, I'm specifically going to be talking about the pre-game. And what the pre-game is, I'm going to be covering off on the following items. What you should be doing before looking for a game, uh, and it, particularly if it is your first game as well, the item checklist that you should have for when you are going to go to where you're playing your game, whether that's your army, whether that's your army list, all that kind of stuff. And the pre-game setup of how you actually set up for a game of Warhammer 40k. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we go any further if you have not already please consider hitting that subscribe button down below we do have a bunch more content coming out this year not just for this series we're also going to delve into some more of the intermediate and advanced core mechanics of the game that can really help level up your gameplay after understanding how to play the game at the basic level but ladies and gentlemen without further ado let's jump into it First up, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be covering off on what to do before looking for your first game of Warhammer 40k. Now, when you're ready to start looking for a game, to get your first game under your belt, whether that's at a gaming store or at a gaming community that meets at another venue, there are a few things you're going to want to do beforehand. The first thing up is you'll want to decide what army you want to go with. If you've got multiple uh, disposal for your first starting army, maybe you've got Space Marines and Necrons from Indominus or the Elite Edition or a couple of those box sets, um, you know, and you'll want to write up an army list for those. So generally for your first game, you're probably wanting to have an army list that's either a thousand points or 50 power level is what I would recommend to start off with. The second thing is that you'll want to have at least a read through of the rules at the core mechanics level of the base game, so the turn progression, as we'll be going through in the coming videos, but also a read through your codex and codex supplement if you are using one, particularly if you're using a faction, say like Death Watch, Black Templars, or maybe there's a Dark Elder or other supplements out there that you are using. And have a brief understanding of those before you actually get into your game so you kind of have a bit of an idea of what each of your things does and what you're going to be doing in the game. The third for this point is that when you go to do a post on a game stores or a gaming community's online forum, may it be a Facebook group, it could be a Rumbler page, it could be an online forum, so many different uh, avenues that you could look for a game and communities in, you're going to want to come up with a couple of things and set your own expectations. So most communities will have these type of forums available to set up a game for. When doing so and you're doing this post, make sure to mention the points or the power level you're looking to play so that you're setting that expectation of, hey, this is the level of game that I'm wanting to play. Mention that you're new to the game, that this might be your first or second or third game of Warhammer 40K and that you'll likely need help with learning how to play the game and going through the general mechanics of the game. And this will also set the expectation of your opponent going, hey, I'm not really looking to teach someone how to play the game, or you may have someone come to you, hey, I'd love to teach you how to play the game. And you know, those are the kind of people you're looking for that are gonna be a bit more patient uh, and a bit more helpful in terms of explaining those mechanics for your first couple of games. And the third thing is that you want to play as a casual style of game. This will set the expectation that you're not wanting to learn high competitive level strategies and use every single rule under the sun to start off with, but you've set it that it's just a casual game, it's one of my first couple of games, even if it is your first, and I'm just wanting to learn how to play the game in general. So by mentioning these things, it'll actually set the expectations for what you are expecting the gameplay experience to be. Now, the fourth point that I would add here is to make sure you yourself have realistic expectations uh, for your first game or for, for your first couple of games. I highly recommend going into it the mindset of just enjoying yourself, enjoying the process of learning the game rather than trying to win any of your games. Whilst yes, you're gonna to wanna to score points and, and you know do stuff with your units and have fun, roll dice, all that kind of stuff, 100% you're gonna play the game as it's intended, 
but don't go in there trying to win. Go in there trying to have fun and just learn the game as this is a hobby and if you focus on having fun first before winning, nine times out of 10, you'll enjoy your games. Unfortunately, there is that gonna be one out of 10 game where you might not have the greatest opponent and that'll be the factor there. You mightn't enjoy yourself there, but nine times out of 10, you shall. Next up is an item checklist of what you should be taking with you. Now, this is a list uh, for your first game or your first couple of games uh, that you should look at. You know, it can be difficult to understand what you need to take, what you don't need to take with you uh, for your first game. And just really, you know, it gives you an example of what you can do. There are other things that you can add to this list if you choose to do so. There are other things that, you know, wouldn't be helpful as well. But to get into the list, I highly recommend this as a basic level of things that you should be taking with you. Now, number one on that list is your army. Now, sure you may have plenty of models to choose from for your game to start off with, say you've got a couple of Elite Editions and you've got a lot um, there that you can choose from, I'd only suggest taking what you're actually going to use in your army list. Because then you're not having to transport everything to the store or where the club and community is meeting. So it decreases the amount that you have to take with you. A copy of your army list. Now, if you take a copy of your army list, this is for your opponent. You know what your unit units are and what you're running in your list. But at the same time, you need to be able to go, hey, here's a copy of my list. You know, it can also help in post-game feedback when you're going, hey, how do you think my list can improve? Is there any way that, you know, I can improve what I'm doing on the table? Things like that that you can ask post-game as well. Uh, a, a copy of the rule book and your codex and or codex supplement. I would say at this stage, don't worry about a chapter approved. This also kind of goes back into when you're setting the expectations. Say that you're playing with your codex points, not the most up-to-date points as well. I will add that for there because you're not going to want to go out and buy a codex, buy a chapter approved, buy the rule book, buy all your minis. It's going to be a lot up front and you're not going to know what to refer to. Really simply start off with your rule book and your codex. Then you're going to want to head to the Warhammer community website where you can download the latest rule book and codex or codex supplement FAQs just so then you've got the most up-to-date rules, references for your both core rules and codex and army. That way you're not having to go, hey, this is the way that the codex says it, but oh, your opponent then says, well, actually the FAQ updated this and then you have to find it. During the game, you've already got it on hand. You may have already read through it. So you're aware of that change. Of course, you're gonna need dice and a tape measure to be able to play the game, to do your rolls for your attacks and saves and measuring out distances with a tape measure is a lot easier than maybe some of the whippy sticks uh, that you may have seen in previous editions or the clear cellophane 12 inch rulers uh, that they give you in starter sets nowadays. And then also I'd highly recommend a notepad and pen or pencil. This is really to keep track of your scores, any tips or tricks that your opponent might give you throughout the game on how you can do things or also things that you can remember for your following turns on what you're trying to do or even just rules to remember as well it can be very helpful to have that. So as I said, these are just the basic items that I'd recommend taking with you to not just your first couple of games, but all of your games going forward. You can add to this over time, whether it's uh, movement templates to assist you with quick movement, laser pointers and laser lines to help you determine the line of sight. And if you can actually see models, things like that, you can add in later. Now, the pre-game setup. Now, this is going to be long and I want you to stick with me for this because I'm going to go through the core rulebook walkthrough that is in the Warhammer 40k rulebook from page 280 for match play missions. Now, for Crusade, it'll be very similar to this. Not exactly the same, but it'll be similar. Same with open play to some extent. But we're going to use the match play rules as you're probably playing a match play game with a thousand points or 50 power level. So there are actually 13 different steps to go through before you actually get into playing the game. It doesn't mean there's not rolling of dice and choosing things before you get to the game. But what it does mean is there's a couple of things that you need to do to get ready to wage that fight. So the first thing you've actually already done. 
which is come up with the game size that you're wanting to play. Across Warhammer 40k, you know I cover this in the army list video, that there are different game sizes, and what you'll see here is in the rulebook on page 280, that they will specify how long each of the different types should take. So they say that, you know, for combat patrol, expect about an hour, incursion, two hours, strike force, three, onslaught, up to four. Those kind of things are a good gauge, but as this is your first game, and you're probably playing with, you know, either a combat patrol at 500 points or a incursion level at 1,000 points or 50 power, they recommend about two hours. I would actually go a bit further. As it is your first game or your first couple of games, I'd highly recommend giving that an extra hour. So expecting the game to go at least for three hours, just so you're then able to walk through the rules that you're not under a time crunch, that you're able to actually enjoy the process of learning how to play the game. The second point you've actually also already done, which is writing up your own army list for the game size you're wanting to play at. So that means, you know, having that army list that is up, up to a thousand points or below that and or, and or up to 50 power level or below that as well, because you could play 25 power level if you really wanted to, or 500 points or 750 points as other examples as well. But you've already done that and you've already communicated that to your opponent. So they've already got their army list ready to go as well. Now we get to the third one, which is you do this once you're at the game store or the gaming community with your opponent and you're determining the mission that you're going to be playing. In the core rulebook for Combat Patrol, there are three different missions to choose from, but you're more than likely going to be playing at an incursion level, which has six missions that you can choose from. Now, with your opponent, you can either agree on a particular mission to play from those six, or you could randomly determine one by just rolling a dice and say it comes up as a four, you compare that four with what the mission number four is on that table on page 281, and you're good to go. After you determine your mission, you're gonna to wanna to read through on that relevant page what that mission entails. It's gonna have a deployment map on the second page there. It's gonna show you, you know, the size of the table in terms of, you know, we'll get into the size of the table a bit more, but it will be relevant here. Uh, in terms of where the objectives are to be placed, the deployment areas, and that's about it. But that is your template of what the table should look like before you put any terrain onto it. Now, it'll also have potentially a secondary mission that you can take. So we'll talk about uh, mission second, secondary objectives, sorry, a bit later on in the video. Uh, but you can take this as one of your secondaries if you choose to do so. Now, each mission will also have a primary objective, which is the objective markers you place on the field. And you can score up to 45 points on these primary objective markers by just holding them throughout the game. And each mission will tell you how you actually score those points. Now, there are two different types of parameters that you'll see. The more common one is holding one objective will get you five points, holding two objectives will get you another five, and holding more than your opponent will get you another five points. The second variant on that is very similar, but a little different at the same time, is holding two objectives, you get five points, holding three objectives, you get five points, and then holding more than your opponent, you get the third five points. To a maximum of 15 every turn, uh, except you do not score it at the first turn. So from rounds two, three, four, and five, you do score those. And we'll talk about that later on in the command phase video. Now, once you have uh, seen the deployment map, you actually mark out the table size and then place the objective markers on it that are shown on that deployment map for the mission. So your table size is again, very similar to your point sizes and the time for the games will vary depending on the mission. So for a game of combat patrol or incursion, the table is gonna be 44 inches wide by 30 inches at a minimum. Now, for Strike Force games, if you are choosing to play above a thousand points in the future, uh, it is played on a minimum of 44 inches by 60 inches for the table size, and then onslaught sized games, you're playing at a minimum of 44 inches by 90 inches. So quite a large table uh, at those massive 3,000 points or above game size. Sorry, 2,000 points or above game size. Now, after you do this, after you set up the objectives and you marked out the table. You then add terrain to the table because you are likely playing on a 44 by 30 inch table size. I'd only recommend maybe five to seven pieces of terrain uh, with maybe something directly in the center of the table to kind of block line of sight and control some fire lanes and give you some cover to hide behind. Uh, 
and follow the rules that you can as clear as possible on pages 266 to 269 of the core rulebook that will go into the terrain rules and I'm also going to do a video in the future about the terrain rules as well to give you a better understanding of that. After you've placed the terrain then each of you pick three secondary objectives for your army. Now you do this in secret so you could pick the mission specific secondary if you wish uh, you, your codex may have already had its ninth edition release so you may have secondaries in your core codex if you're wanting to use that or a supplement you have access to those as well as your core, core codex ones uh, but you can only choose one from either of those and then then you can choose from the ones on the pages of 284 and 285 of the core rulebook now you can only choose one from each of these categories so take note as if you choose one from your codex or your codex supplement you won't be able to choose one from the same category from the core rulebook and these categories come under purge the enemy no mercy no respite battlefield supremacy shadow operations and warp craft now some of these are going to be killing your opponent some of these are going to be controlling objectives or controlling the battlefield in terms of having units in different quarters uh, protecting your own units or performing actions on objectives or performing actions interacting with your enemy depending on the psychic power ones which is the warcraft now there are plenty to choose from i think there's about 12 or so in the core rule book that you can choose from maybe some more i don't have the rough number off the top of my head but there is a decent amount to choose from and some good variety there now i will note that the ones in the core rule book are going to differ from the gt mission pack and so just be aware of that if your opponent does say hey could we play the gt missions and it's your first game Ask them politely if you can play the ones out of the core rulebook as you, had, you don't know the ones out of the GT mission pack. So for each of these secondaries, you can score up to 15 points over the course of the game and you can start scoring them from turn one. Now for each secondary being at 15 points, it gives you a total of 45 points for your secondaries throughout the course of the game. Now, once both players have chosen secretly, of course, your secondaries, you then tell each other what your secondaries are so you each know what you're trying to score. After revealing your secondaries here, you and your opponent then roll off. So that's just rolling a dice and whoever gets the highest result is the winner of that roll off. And that person who does win the roll off gets to choose whether they're gonna be the attacker or defender. This is just a mere reference point for what's coming up in a couple of the future steps on the pre-game of setting up. After this dice roll, the person who is the defender will get to choose the deployment zone out of the two that are on the mission deployment map. And the attacker will obviously have to use the other one. So if you win, generally the person who wins may pick defender. Uh, or, you know, if the more experienced player has won the roll off, they may choose to pick attacker and help you deploy and set up like that as well. May not happen, but also might dice are fickle. After doing this, you then secretly choose any units, if you have them, to deploy in dedicated transports. If you have got some of those in your army, say you're a Dark Elder and you've got a Raider or a Venom that you're wanting to use with some Cavalite Warriors or Witches, you can deploy them in there in this step uh, before you even put them onto the battlefield. Or you can put units outside and off the table in what's called strategic reserves. Now, some units will have their own rules that allow them to do that, like Space Marine Terminators. And there are some that will have some armies that will have stratagems that you can then go and spend some command points to take a unit or two units to place in strategic reserves to do very similar things there. Or you can use the strategic reserve rules on page 256 and 257 for the outflanking rules, or that is what they're more commonly known as. It's where they walk on the sides of the battlefield throughout the course of the game. But again, this is another rules mechanic that you don't really need to concern yourself too much about right now for your first couple of games, and I'm gonna cover it more in depth in future videos. Now, there is the rule in place that only up to half your army's units can be placed in strategic reserve, and they must not equal more than half your army's total points. So if you are wanting to do some reserves and put units in there, keep that in mind that playing at 1,000 points, you're gonna to have to make sure you have less than 500 points in there uh, for strategic reserves. Now, strategic reserves can't arrive during the first battle round, which is both players' first turns, uh, and if they do not come onto the battlefield by the end of battle round three, so by the end of both players' third turns, 
it means they're actually going to be considered destroyed for the purpose of the game. So you need to make sure if you do choose to put them in strategic reserves that you do remember to use them in your games and bring them on. Now, being your first couple of games, this is going to be a new process for you to understand. And again, we're going to cover it again in a future video more in depth for not just outflanking strategic reserves, but how to deploy these kind of units and such as well. Now, after doing this, the player who is the defender deploys their entire army within their deployment zone. And once they're done, the attacker, who is the other player, will deploy their entire army in their deployment zone. Now, you shouldn't really encounter this rule during your first couple of games. Uh, I'd be surprised if you do, but if you do, um, there's a rule for models that are too large to fit within your deployment zone. What you have to do is you then have to place it right up against your battlefield edge, which is marked out on the battlefield deployment map. And during the first battle round, it's it can't move in any way, so it can't make a normal move, fall back, advance, it can't make a charge or heroic intervention move. Uh, it can't cast or deny psychic powers. It can't make any shooting attacks, nor can it perform any actions or psychic actions. But if it is charged, you can make attacks back in close combat, of course. So just bear that in mind when you're considering the units that you're taking in your army lists, that you, you're able to actually place them down on the field and not have that hindrance, if at all possible. Now, there are some units in the game that have got rules that allow them to be deployed after everything has been deployed for both armies during your deployment phases. If both yourself and your opponent have got units like these, then what you do again is you just roll off and whoever wins the dice roll places the first unit and then you alternate until both sides have completed their units. Uh, for this process, again, these are very similar to strategic reserve rules that they're quite rare, but they are around. So it's good to be aware of that process. After this has all been done, I highly recommend both you and your opponent shake hands before the game, wish each other good luck. Of course, we are still in COVID time, so you know if there is outbreaks in such an area, be smart about it. Um, maybe it's like a fist bump or an elbow bump, you know, being smart and wise about your health as well. But we should still wish each other good luck. Then you each roll a dice doing a roll off once again, and whoever has the highest result gets to choose whether to go first or second during the battle round. So it'll mean that someone will have the top of the battle round and someone will have the bottom of the battle round. Now this, I will mention that this is different to the GT mission pack where the player who does win the roll off does go first. So just bear that in mind when you do make that transition if you do eventually. Now, after you've done this, if either player has abilities that need to be resolved before the first turn begins, uh, they are done so now, starting off with the person who is taking the first turn in the first battle round. After you complete that and all of those preceding steps, the battle begins. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you got a lot out of this video. I know that there was a lot to take in regarding the setup in the lead up to the game and also the setting up of how to play a game of Warhammer 40k as well. I highly recommend if there was anything you got stuck on or you didn't understand in the first time listening through, feel free to go through again and watch it and understand. Even if you feel like doing so, drop a comment down below asking questions. I'm happy to answer your questions. So to give you some clarity and if you haven't done so already, make sure to hit that like and subscribe on the video as well. I hope that through this video, I've given you a clear explanation of all that's required in not just getting to the game and how to set up for the game, but also things you should be doing before you get to the game as well. Now, if you've got any feedback on the video, leave it in the comments below, or if you have any further questions, feel free to jump in the Discord as well. And you know, I can't be at a computer 24 seven, I'm afraid I still need to get eight hours of sleep every night, but hit up the Discord. There are plenty of members right across the world in there. We've got over a hundred members in there as well. You can ask questions in there and they can answer them as well. Or try and catch me whilst I'm live over on Twitch where I do stream hobby sessions, live games and tournament coverage from Australia on Tuesday and Friday nights and Saturdays during the day. And some Sundays when I'm out at two day tournaments. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you got a lot out of it and I'll catch you in the next one.